the trends down. So if you buy in and it turns against you, you start losing the losing money, you have to cut it at one point. You have to take a small loss, get out, regroup, try again to get in. Don't don't hold all the way down and then so sell uh, months later when you lost 80% of the holding or something. Uh, could that happen? It can always happen. So that's a little bit of a reminder of everybody to talk about the rules, which are to take profits. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Monday live stream. A lot of things to go over. So let's just jump right in. So just like the title and the thumbnail suggests, we're taking a look at this is from Jeremy Allaire. He's the CEO of Circle. And when I read this article, I thought to myself, maybe I've gotten it extremely wrong about what I think about as far as like United States and how they're leading crypto and digital assets into the next evolution. So with this article, maybe I was wrong, and it kind of shakes up my predispositions about what I think is going on behind the scenes. And I got to tell you, if it's somebody like Jeremy Allaire, who was trying to go public with the company Circle, which is responsible for USDC, the stablecoin, maybe it's something to take a look at. So this is what we got. Circle CEO claims the US is on the path to becoming the decisive leader in crypto. Stablecoin issue will be moving into one of the top floors of New York's One World Trade Center. Now, I think I'm 100% sure that they actually are still in the United States. But it is odd because when we talk about crypto and ecosystem digital assets, we start to think about the different companies that are moving offshore and getting away. And we talk about how Gary Gensler and the SEC and the current administration, which is not too favorable to crypto and regulations. We see what's going on with Ripple. We see what's going on with Coinbase. We saw what happened with Kraken as they got sued twice. So the question is, why even stay here? But again, not pretty dispositions. Maybe I was wrong. Circle will be joining 692 crypto and blockchain firms with over 800 founders that call New York their home, which I got to tell you is very odd to me. Why would you be in New York? I think the taxes are astronomical, but sure. So he states, this is Alaire, New York may have the most talent density in crypto of any city in the world. We are investing in New York. We are investing in America. And it wasn't just him. Solana co-founder, President Raj Gokul said, New York's forward-thinking regulate, I don't believe this is true, but it, New York's forward-thinking regulators, <clears throat> I believe they, sure, and thriving tech scene are key to fostering innovation. And we are just getting started. Representative Richard Torres, a member of the House Financial Services Committee, backed them up and said financial innovation is a key driver of New York's economy and our country's future. And it's critical that the innovative companies of the future are born and nurtured here in the USA. 2020, 2025 will be the year for stable coins, says Alaire. And he says 2024 has been a turning point, a year in crypto and stable coins, a year when stable coins started to truly break out in scale, importance, and usage. 2025 will be the year when this goes mainstream. And I personally believe that 2025 is the year when we actually take off uh, for the next bull run. But it made me think about this and maybe. Wanted to show you again what we had talked about. This is from Visa. These are stablecoin transactions. And we can see that, you know, as stablecoins came into a notoriety and they became the mainstay for crypto digital asset space, we can see that there was quite a bit of jump over the last two years or so. But it hasn't been until recently, looking at March of 2024, it was the highest transactional volume ever in March of 2024. The second highest, actually the third highest, I, I should say, is August of 2024. And of course, we're here in September, just around uh, uh, not too far through. Actually, 16th, 17th, there's, uh, what's the date today? 16th, yeah. So we can see that there's a, quite a bit of transactional volume. And over the last 30 days, it's 1.3 trillion. Think that. Think about that. That is a massive amount. And then also, if you're talking about stable coins, you have to talk about one of the biggest, which is Tether. And we had covered this, say, about a week ago or so. And I don't know if you knew this, but first of all, Tether is outpacing revenue for even BlackRock, even though they have 150 employees and BlackRock has in the thousands. The cost per employee is 
or the revenue that was that has been generated is astronomical compared to the juggernaut that is BlackRock. Now, assets under management, yes, I understand, but as far as revenue, did you know that Tether accounts for their 19th globally for all U.S. treasuries? So when people say, well, what's Tether really backed by? It's backed by everything. It's backed by dollars, it's backed by treasury, it's backed by gold, it's backed by securities. It is backed by a large percentage. And I can see why, we talked this this last week, why America would start and want to embrace stable coins and maybe cryptos and digital assets because you can't bank everybody, but you can stick a crypto wallet in everybody's phone. And before people say, well, who's, who's got smartphones? Even in third world countries, the majority of people have smartphones. And we've actually taken a look about this uh, in these different reports. So I'm not saying that everybody in the world has it, but there are more smartphones than there are people that are actually banked in the world. So we have that piece and I just thought to myself, man, maybe I'm wrong. And then on top of that, this just came out today and this isn't a big deal, but you know, slowly, and then everything starts to take off. The kingdom of Bhutan now owns 13,000 Bitcoin worth $780 million. I was great. So, you know, first we have El Salvador. And then, of course, we have, <clears throat> I should say, all the countries that uh, have confiscated Bitcoin are holding quite a bit of that as well. But now we have the kingdom of Bhutan getting into the mix. Now, uh, from what I understand, this is not something where they have confiscated it. They've, they've actually bought Bitcoin and they're into it. So again, this is just one more small stepping stone. Is this like the biggest news of all time? No, but I like to see where things are going as, as more sovereign nations, sovereign countries are actually picking up Bitcoin, holding it, custodying it, and watching it appreciate. So we have that on that sector. But what about macro? Because this week, I believe it's in uh, actually Wednesday. I think we got Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell coming out to announce the rate cuts. And if you're like me, you thought to yourself, ah, 25 is in the bag. Check this out. So this is a FedWatch tool. And we can see that right now the current target rate is 525 to 550. 25 basis points just <clears throat> 10 days ago <clears throat> was a 70-30 split. And now it looks like 61% of the market believes that it's going to be a 50 basis points cut. <clears throat> I don't know if this is true. Hold on. But if it is, I mean, this is what the market believes is going to happen. This is not what is going to happen. So we'll see how it works out uh, in the next two days or so. And as a reminder, I don't really cover this too much, but a uh, friend of the show, Tom Ground, Crown, does a great job. And he's got a live stream going on on Wednesday, uh, September 18th. So if you'd like to hop over there, I'll be there listening to this as it comes out live. I put a link in the description. You can actually be notified when this actually goes live. And we hear from Jerome Powell straight from the horse's mouth to see what's happening. So 50 basis points is great, right? What about 75 basis points? Well, guess what? Everybody's favorite crypto Karen, Senator Elizabeth Warren looks like she is asking for us from Simon Dixon, friend of the show, uh, 75 basis points cuts. And she is asking that Jerome Powell do this right now or at the uh, Wednesday meeting because she believes that that's how far it should go. I will tell you this. This is actually uh, delivered today. And uh, looks like, yeah, we write today to urge the Federal Reserve to cut the federal funds rate currently at a two decade high of 5.3% by 75 basis points at the FOMC or the Federal Open Market Committee meeting on September 17th and 18th. Remember, the 17th is when everybody meets and the 18th is when they actually have the, they give the results, what they're actually going to do. Given the Fed's confidence in inflation moving towards its target of 2%, and data indicating slower job growth, now is the time to swiftly move forward with rate cuts. And I must, I will remind you, I was actually doing a search for this, 75 basis points. And uh, this one came up first. This was on November 1st, 2022, where she said the same thing, actually. Lawmakers Warren and Dean asked Fed Chair to cut by 75 basis points. And essentially what she's saying is like, in this one, she says, how many millions will be thrown out of their jobs from the Fed's dangerous rate hikes? What she wanted to do was not 
have rate hikes. And this was on November 1st, 2022. So I thought to myself, I wonder how that historically worked out. So went to Ben's website, took a look at the federal funds rate. And in November, because remember, we had this thing called a coronavirus. I don't know if you remember that. It was a big thing. And uh, Fed funds rate was pretty much flat until around March of 2022. And then Jerome Powell and the Fed just started raising like crazy. And of course, they had to, right? When you print that much money, you have to take that money out of circulation in some way, shape, or form. So you raise rates. So in July, August, October, and November is when we had it. And then, of course, Elizabeth Warren saying, stop doing that because you're going to crash the economy and it's going to lead to massive unemployment. Massive, massive. That's what she said in the letter. And Jerome said, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And they kept hiking until they plateaued around August of 2023. So how'd the employment rate do? Not bad. So... Actually, in November, and they kept raising, the unemployment rate actually went down in December and then in January. Now there's an uptick, and around here we go, and then up here, and so on and so forth. But it wasn't as bad as what Elizabeth Warren claimed to be. Now, I'm not here to, to say that Elizabeth Warren's evil or she's just totally wrong in that one. We all make little mistakes, but I don't think it was that big of a deal. I don't know if 75 basis points is the answer, but that's way above my pay grade. That's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. Now, if you want to uh, do a little Q&A and &A, can, uh, go over some questions right here, uh, we'll, I'll answer all your questions to the best of my abilities. But if you got to take off, take off. Thanks so much for stopping by.